Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Intel with Greg Cosell. I'm Jeff Mosher from Inside the Birds alongside Adam Kaplan, my Inside the Birds co-host. And of course, the Intel with Greg Cosell stars the man right here, Greg Cosell, and it is an Inside the Birds presentation. So, Greg, we intentionally pushed your show back a few days this week because we wanted to make sure that you were able to analyze all Oh boy. The Eagles free agents. I even dressed up for you today. You know, you can tell. Can That's tell. right. You even got the, uh, the old mustard hoodie on there. Um, but it turns out all of their signings is just one signing so far. And as it's a big now, one yes, for them. As of now. As of now. Although as it as appears that Harry Roseman made a signing himself. Yeah. Might be the second biggest free <laughs> agent. Well, he wasn't really a free agent. So right, that was right, right. Extension. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so let's talk about it because Adam and I have talked in great detail. Uh, not only with you, but even on the podcasts leading up, that we knew the Eagles had interest in Hassan Reddick, uh, and specifically to play a certain role. But it's within that role where I think we have the most amount of questions. So sure. Hassan Reddick is an outside linebacker, and when the Eagles uh, announced him, as even though we know he's a pass rusher first and foremost, they announced him as a linebacker signing. So explain to us what you think his role will be within Jonathan Gannon's defense. Well, let's just start with what Reddick is at his best. What Reddick mm -hmm. is at his best is an on-the-ball pass rusher. And by on-the-ball, it means he's not he's on the line of scrimmage. He's not stacked as a linebacker. Right, so right. that's what he is at his best. That's what he came out of Temple as. And he was initially switched to play stacked linebacker because he only weighed 239 pounds. So the assumption was that he had to be a stacked backer and not necessarily an on-the-ball player un unless you were playing in your sub when he could rush the quarterback. That did not really work out because that's not what he really is. And then when Carolina signed him, they pretty much said, hey, he's an on-the-ball player. And he had a really good year for Carolina last year. So now let's transition to what we saw from Jonathan Gannon's defense a year ago with the assumption being that the methodology and the structure will be essentially the same. Obviously, tweaks are always made, but it doesn't appear, and I think you guys have probably had these conversations with people in the building, that the entire structure of the defense will essentially stay the same, will not dramatically change. Is that fair, guys, from what you've learned? Uh, it's it's sort of an – I mean, I think Adam and I both heard that there could be – like you mentioned, some tweaks that do – look different when it comes out next year, but I do agree structurally, similarly, yes, that, that there'll and, and be And the reason I ask that, Jeff, be some because of that. the reason I ask that is because to me, Reddick is not a signing to take the place of TJ Edwards or Alex Singleton. Now we can debate whether they need to get better there. Or that's a, a conversation we can have either later or another time, but right. I don't believe he was signed to take one of those spots. Right. I believe he was essentially signed to do two things. When they're in their base defense, they essentially were a 5-2 front. Mm -hmm. And I believe he was signed to play on the outside, on the ball, in their 5-2 front, in their base, the position that Avery predominantly played a year ago with the rookie Patrick Johnson also getting some snaps there. But mm -hmm. So if we talk about their base defense, I believe that's what he was signed for. Agreed. Then when, when you go to their sub, whether it's nickel or dime, which remains to be seen, I, I believe he was signed to be an edge pass rusher. Uh, and the bottom line is this. We all love Brandon Graham. He's had an unbelievable career, but he's going to be 33 years old and he's coming off one of the worst injuries you could possibly have at any position in the NFL much less rushing the quarterback where you've got to plant and change direction. And so we all hope he can make it back because he's a great guy, but there's no guarantee he makes it back. That, that I think the people I think are just assuming, oh, Graham's back. We don't know that. They probably don't even know that as we speak here in what, um, mid-March. Um, so to me, he was essentially signed to be an edge pass rusher opposite Josh Sweat when they go to their nickel or dime. And keep one thing in mind, though. Even if Graham can make it back, we've seen Graham move inside and rush the quarterback from the three-technique spot. So if Graham miraculously is back and is, and is Brandon Graham, then 
he can move inside and they still have Sweat and Reddick on the outside rushing the quarterback. Greg, when we talk about Reddick, and I, I, talk, I remember talking to the Panthers about this uh, last season, there's just something about him as a run and chase player. Like they they didn't have any, as good as Brian Burns is, as a, we could also talk about him. They just had did not have anyone like this guy because it's hard to find guys who are this explosive. Correct. When you watch Reddick's tape, and you obviously you go back to Temple, and you talk about the Cardinals who had trouble, although they did figure it well, out the last year he was. Then in the last year, they kind yeah. of put him on the outside. Yes. Yeah. So, so how has he evolved as a pass rusher, and and how explosive does he look on tape to you? Oh, I think he's extremely explosive. I mean, I think that that's his game. I think that he's he's a guy that can win off the edge. He can bend. See, a lot of times when you when there, there's a couple of things you look at when you look at pass rushers. And, you know, I've learned more and more, and, and I'm, I know you have too. You're talking about, for the most part, pass rushers win within a two or three yard area of, of the snap. You know, if you're really talking about good pass rushers, there's pass rushers who get sacks as second reaction sacks, as where they redirect and they chase a guy down. I mean, Reddick can do all that too. But if you're really talking about a great pass rusher, you're talking about the two to three yard metric. That's where they have to win. And you can win any number of ways. Reddick can win in that two to three yard metric and he can bend and he's explosive off the ball. So what he does immediately is he challenges the outside of the offensive tackle. He makes offensive tackles at times have to overset because he's so quick mm. to challenge their mm. outside. And then when you get tackles to overset and turn their body, you've essentially won because then it sets up other things that you can do. But he's an explosive edge rusher. And that to me, to me, you don't sign Reddick unless you're going to use him in that role. Why, why else would you sign him? That's his best trait. Yes. Right. So, so because we constantly get asked this and the numbers, sometimes people just get fixated on sack numbers, Greg. So I'll ask you th this two part question. Yeah. How do you compare and contrast Hassan Reddick in the Eagles defense to the man he's replacing, which theoretically is Derek Barnett, right? An edge rusher in the nickel and dime um, in that situation, a four man rush. How yeah. do you compare him to, to what Derek Barnett brought and how would you compare Hassan to some of the more elite pass overall pass rushers in the league, whether it's a TJ Watt or a Max Crosby or uh, a Bosa, where is he in that well, kind of pantheon? Interesting question. And I'll say this to start sometimes, not all the time, but probably more often than not, Jeff sacks can be an overrated statistic. I agree. Okay. So, I mean, obviously when, you know, if a guy has a season like TJ Watt or, or, you know, I mean, that's great. But the key, and, and pretty much every defensive coach will tell you this, that the goal is to speed up the quarterback. You know, it's hard to sack the quarterback in the NFL, which is why there aren't 10 sacks every game. You know, when quarterbacks drop back 45 times, you know, if you get four sacks, it's a nice day. You know, there's not 10 sacks every week. So the goal is to speed up the quarterback. Okay. So Reddick, um, Reddick's a better pass rusher than Derek Barnett. So they, whatever happens with Barnett, is he a free agent? Yes. Yes. Okay. So he has not signed anywhere yet. Correct. Right. So the Eagles will not, again, I, I can't speak for Howie Roseman, but given that they just signed Reddick, mm -hmm. the only way Barnett would be back is if no one was willing to give him anything and he came back on a one-year deal that was probably not going to be for a lot of money. But, Adam, you know that stuff better than I. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But the Eagles are not going to – offer Derek Barnett a, a multi-year deal at a big number. Derek Bar uh, Hassan Reddick is going to replace Derek Barnett. Um, and he's better than Derek Barnett as a pass rusher. Right. Um, so now if you're asking me how he compares to other guys in the league, um, then you're getting into the specifics of how guys rush the quarterback, Jeff. Mm -hmm. I mean, Reddick is not necessarily a power rusher. You know, he's not going to play off contact the same way that the Boses do, for instance. Sure, you know, sure. he's he's probably more and, and I don't want people who are listening to sort of fall off their chairs. <laughs> Stylistically, he's probably more like TJ Watt in just his ability to get the edge, you know, win off the arc. That's what they call it. The arc. He's probably that's his game. Um, mm -hmm. You know, TJ Watt is phenomenal at it, obviously. You know, Reddick has moments where he's like that. 
but mm-hmm. he's more stylistically, he's more like that. He's not necessarily a a hand usage initiate and playoff contact guy. Can he do that on occasion? Yes, every pass rusher has to do that on occasion because there is an offensive tackle in front of you. You know, he's not going to say, here, go to the quarterback. So you have to do that at times, but that's not ultimately what his game is. All right, so Greg, let's stay on the defensive side and in the theme now. And the Eagles were were deep in discussions, we're told, on trying to sign Marcus Williams, who wound up signing with the Baltimore Ravens. You studied that Ravens defense for years, whether it was um, maybe different now. They have a yeah, new coordinator, right? With, with uh, Mike McDonald Mike running. McDonald. Back. But again, they've had this philosophy of defense. They've been really good for many years. Obviously, sometimes elite. Marcus Williams is a guy you've seen a lot. Yeah. What what, what what does he bring to the Ravens? Well, you know, it's funny. I just, in some ways, I want to correct myself. It may not be significantly different because he was at Michigan last year. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And he was actually with the Ravens prior to that, right. and. It, yeah. My guess is they did not want to lose Mike McDonald. They probably loved him when he was there, and they thought he'd probably get a lot of offers, and they and that's why they, quote-unquote, fired Martindale, who's a really good coordinator, yeah. and decided that they, want to, they didn't want to lose Mike McDonald because he's sure. a young, up-and-coming guy. But the reason I'm mentioning this is in my college study, I, I watch Michigan, and I'm still – haven't finished watching Michigan, but because they've got guys that you know, i got to see um, – and I noticed a lot, which is rare for college tape, a lot of NFL pressure concepts at mm. Michigan. So I was just, when you mentioned Mike McDonald, then I kind of corrected myself and said, well, maybe it won't be that different because yeah. he was doing some cool stuff in Michigan, which you don't really see very mm. much in college football. But anyway, that's beside the point. The point is that Marcus Williams is what he's been up to this point, again, these guys who do their due diligence, they know him better than I. I can only tell you what the tape shows. He has essentially been a post safety, a free safety. He's not very much played in the box. He's not very often matched up man to man. Um, has he done that on a case? Sure, everybody does it on occasion. But for the most part, he's been a free safety, arguably the best free safety in the league. So I don't know what Mike McDonald's plan is. Because if you're going to just do that, we discussed this with the Eagles, guys, as you recall, the idea that you, you'd love to have interchangeable safeties. Yep. So on some level, you're not predictable on your back end. And uh, uh, for the most part, he's been a, a free safety. So I don't know what Mike McDonald's plan is, um, but he's, like I said, probably been the best free safety in the league over the last mm-hmm. number of years. All right. I have major questions about scheme and usage, and so does Adam, because, um, you know, the Eagles are obviously under, this is a different style of defense than they've ever played uh, that I can at least remember, Greg, um, certainly in the last 20 years, so especially with the 5 2 front that you're referring to. Which has become very prevalent in the league, Jeff. Right, right. I mean, they are going, not, right. That's why people, them, yeah. Yeah, people say, well, what happens if Gannon leaves next year and you built this game? And we keep saying it's okay. The league is going in this direction the anyway. Is, so yeah, it's, yeah. Every, almost everybody's doing this. Yeah. Right, right. So so let's start with, with scheme itself for Reddick. When we had you on to do the pass rusher show, you mentioned that about Hassan both last year in Carolina and I think the year before his final year in Arizona, he played in very blitz-heavy schemes um, where right. – you can see. I mean, you watch a lot of his sacks. They come off uh, six man rushes. A lot of a lot of twists. A lot of stunts. A lot of uh, overloads. Getting him to run free at times. Not that he can't create his own pressures, but what we've seen from Jonathan Gannon is the opposite of a blitz heavy scheme. Uh, we wonder if when you have a player like this, if you just line him up on the edge and ask him to rush the passer from the edge, seventy five percent of the time, is that the right kind of usage for what Hassan Reddick? does and can he flourish in a, in a not heavily schemed defensive front if if my terminology makes sense no i understand exactly what you're asking and he can beat tackles there's no question he can what we do not know and don't forget we still have free agency in the draft yep my sense okay mm-hmm. i have not spoken with jonathan gannon i'd still like to but i've not my sense is that he would like to do a lot more than he did last year Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. my sense. We now, agree. We, we agree. know that fans, you know, got pissed at him, and that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, you have to do what you think your players can execute. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's the bottom line. You know, it's always easy to say let's blitz. That's easy. You know, 
But number one, you need good blitzers. And number two, football is a numbers game, guys. So the more people you rush, the less you have in coverage. So that limits your coverage options when you when you blitz. You do not have to play man coverage 100% of the time when you blitz, but more often than not, you are going to play man coverage when you blitz, okay? There's no percentage to that, but it's usually above 50%. You're going to play man coverage. I, I My sense watching their tape last year, even though they increased their man percentage as the year went on, I don't know if they felt really comfortable playing man behind pressure. You know, because that's different than playing man in a seven-man defense, you know, coverage system. Right. So we're going to find out what they do in the draft or or because free agency at this point is not likely to bring a great corner. I mean, I, you know, there might be a few out there, but if, if they're – like Stefan Gilmore, I think he's still out there, but I don't yeah. think the Eagles are going to be paying that kind of money. I could be wrong, Adam. You know this, like I said, yeah. better than I. But, But – We'll see what they do in the draft, guys. But I think that he would like to pressure more, mm -hmm. for sure. And I also think Reddick is a guy that can be moved around and, you know, in a joker way where he does yes. not just have to be an edge rusher. He can stand up on the ball. He can move around to try to look for good matchups. You know, I think they'd <laughs> like to be able to do that. But you have to feel good about your coverage. Don't forget – People can rip Jonathan Gannon all they want, but the Eagles did not give up a lot of big pass plays last year. And as Adam knows, you know, and Jeff, you were at the Combine as well, you talk to coaches now on each side of the ball. What do offensive players want? Explosive plays. What do defensive players want to prevent? Explosive plays. X plays, right? Yeah. Right, right. So, you know, you can talk all day long about, well, he should have blitzed more. He should have done yeah. this. He should have sure. done that. You know, he knows his players better than we do. He's with them every day. We're not. So, you know, I think he wants to do more, but you've got to be able to, to – you have to have the players to be able to do more. That, that is true. That is true. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about this defense, when they had it going on, when you go, okay, this, this is a good week for them, were there any things that stood out over the course of the season where you go, okay, they, they, they do this well? What, what did the Eagles defense do well? Because, again, the one thing that we know points-wise, right, they, they did well overall. But what, what did you see that you liked about the defense last season? Well, I think one of the things that did stand out is they were able to generate pressure on quarterbacks. Um, you know, again, it, it, it's not a sack number. You know, I don't yeah. know where their sack total low. was. They were low. Yeah. But they did – they did get people around the quarterback. Um, you know, so I think ultimately that if you look at what this league is, given the fact that it's predominantly a passing league, predominantly, that that's the most critical piece. Because what do you have to do in this league? You have to be able to, to win on third down. And to win on third down, you have to speed up the quarterback. You have to make it difficult for the quarterback to function comfortably on third down. So ultimately, you have to be able to pressure the quarterback. And, you know, as I've known from speaking to many coaches, and you heard yesterday from Coach Pagano, Adam, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can't get there with four, you got to rush five. You know, he even said if you can't get there with five, sometimes you got to rush six. I mean, at some point, you got to speed up the quarterback or you can't play defense in this league. And that's the critical piece. Reddit could do that. He can do yeah. that fast. So, so let me ask you, Greg. If it's let's hypothetically say there's a first down, the Eagles are in their their five two that you speak right. of, um, and the offense comes out twelve personnel, looking like they're going to run, but it's play action pass. Right. In that situation, is a guy like Reddit going to have flat curl responsibilities? Because that you know we've both been told that yeah, that's really coverage and things spatial awareness is. Is not as he's best when he's just going at the quarterback. Or do you just want him? Who who well, can you're not, control that area? Can you play you're, cover you're one man in that situation? Five. Look, I know what you're saying, of course. Right. And and that's true with any team that plays a five two. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, that's like saying, hey, look, the Rams played a five two with their base. So Von Miller on occasion, he didn't. You know, did he rush the quarterback on every single snap? No, of course not. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, it depends on what your coverage is. I mean, if you're playing a zone coverage, okay, let's say you're playing cover three. 
Mm-hmm. Then if you're the outside, essentially the outside defender, you're going to be the flat defender. Right. You know, that's that's your that's what you do in, in cover right. three. You know, it, it, the same would be true in cover four. You'd be the flat defender. Um, sure. More often than not, more often than not, teams would not play man coverage in that situation. Um, if they were, would he have to match up to a, you know, one of the tight ends on occasion, depending on the offensive formation? Perhaps. But yes, there are situations where pass rushers do have to play underneath zone coverage. You see mm-hmm. it all the time in the NFL. It would. Let's put it this way, Jeff. It would not be unique to the Eagles and for Eagles fans then to say, well, what's he doing in coverage? I mean, everybody does that. that that's just part of the NFL, you know? Not every – teams, you know what? They actually come out in 12 personnel on offense and go play action versus 5-2 fronts. That mm-hmm. happens. You know, yep. that's not unique. Right, right. Mm. Um, what, one thing, we, we, you know, Jeff and I are trying to figure out receiver-wise uh, for the Eagles, like who would fit in. We've – the, the the list has been picked over over the first right. couple of free agency. There's not a lot left. Uh, when, when you watch the Eagles receiver core last year, we know they're very young, and that was sort of purposeful, but we thought that they missed out on having a veteran. When you look at their 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 group overall, obviously we could include Goddard with pass targets. What do you think that they need going forward to get this offense going? A more advanced pass game. Okay. How so? I mean, I think that the receiver issue is really, if it's an issue, is reflective of what their offensive approach is. Um, This is not an offensive approach unless it's going to change with an offseason, because my guess is, and we don't know that for certain as we speak today, but my guess is Jalen Hurts will be the quarterback. So if Jalen Hurts is the quarterback, they need to expand their pass game. I mean, let's let's be truly honest. They were able down the stretch to play bad teams and run the ball exceptionally well with a great run game of which Hertz was a meaningful part. There were some weeks he wasn't because he had the ankle, but for the most part, structurally, he was a meaningful part. They ran the ball exceptionally well. Okay. I spoke to coaches at the combine that said the Eagles run game was phenomenal. And then in the next breath, they said, we weren't concerned the least bit about their passing game. So you have to, the passing game needs an expansion of concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, and that starts with the quarterback. So that to me is probably what the focus of the off season will be because we do not know. Oh, and the other thing I heard a lot of was how a lot of defense, I spoke to some defensive back coaches who think Devonte Smith is terrific. So we're good with Devonte Smith. He's really mm-hmm. good. The other receivers will become a function of what the pass game becomes. We can sit here and say, Oh, we like Quez Watkins. We know he can run. Okay. But is he going to get three targets a game? You know, what is their pass game going to be? Because if he's your number two, number two receivers in the NFL don't get three targets a game. You know, if you if you have a true NFL pass game. So to mm-hmm. me, that's that's really the first question, Adam, is what is their pass game going to be? Right. Sure. You sure. know, because the last thing you want to have is just to say, oh, they need receivers and then receivers come to Philly to die. That that happened early on with Lamar Jackson. You know, sure. he's they ran an offense, as you guys know whose structural foundation began with Lamar as a runner, not as a passer. Now they've started to expand that as Lamar has gotten better and they played more, but they would get receivers every year and it didn't matter because their pass game was so remedial and elementary relative yeah. mm-hmm. to the rest of the league. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, w- one more question on uh, the receivers. You mentioned Quez Watkins in passing and, and Sirianni has been very strong in his praise of him. You've now seen him uh, for a couple of years here, and I know you saw his college tape. Yeah. Based on what you saw last season, what do you think he could do as a, as a, a receiver going forward for the Eagles? Well, to be honest with you, that's that's tough for me to answer because I thought his college tape showed basically a, a speed player, you know, a guy who could run. And the question became, what could he become more than that? And I don't think we have an answer to that yet. You know, they might have an answer because they're with him every day in practice. Yeah. But that hasn't shown up on tape, and that's what I'm looking at. You know, I'm not there at practice every day. If they truly believe, because we know Devonta Smith is going to be the quote-unquote number one, whatever, however you define that term, but it's going to be Devonta Smith, um, then can Watkins be that true number two who can run 
multiple route concepts, not just be a vertical guy, not just be a, you know, a tunnel screen guy who can break one once in a while. You know, can he run the kind of routes that you have to run in the NFL? They may feel they have an answer for that. Maybe that's why Nick Sirianni is saying that. We're not there, you know, every day. I, I, I can't answer that, but I hope he is. But we have to the, – the pass game has to be more than it is if they want to get to where they obviously want to go. All right. Uh, I have I have yet another scheme slash personnel question on defense. Right. Um, for, for the longest time, we know the Eagles have built their defensive line, Greg, around one gap penetrators, guys who fly up the field to the quarterback. Correct. Now, if you look, if they had to play a game today, right, Hassan Reddick is going to be that fifth guy uh, in their 5-2 as a strong side linebacker. I suppose the defensive ends, assuming Brandon Graham wasn't ready to play, would be Josh Sweat and maybe Milton Williams because he, he played defensive end uh, last year at times well, and he's a bigger body. But the point, I'm, I, what I'm asking is when you play this style of defense now, this 5-2 front, um, assuming they, they go forward with it, your defensive end is a little bit more head up on the tackle as opposed to when you were in the wide nine. So do they need to look for a different style, you know, different build, different style of defensive end here, seeing how some guys struggled on the line last year with the acclimation and what kind of, what kind of technique, what kind of player is that? And then secondarily, Greg, even on the inside, um, when you have the linebackers playing off the line of scrimmage, the off ball linebackers, uh, as much as Jonathan Gannon did, do they maybe need to beef up what they consider an interior lineman's responsibilities, at least for first and second down, um, a different well, type of lineman there? First of all, if you play a 5-2, Jeff, you can still play multiple front looks. You know, mm -hmm. you can still play one gap in a 5-2. In you don't have to play head up and play two gap. Okay. But what they did last year is it was predominantly Josh Schwett who came inside Right. And, you know, essentially played a four-eye, what we call five technique. Four-eye means he's just inside the offensive tackle. Five mm -hmm. technique means he's kind of head up on the offensive tackle. So you can, you know, that's what Sweat did. One can debate whether that's the best use of Josh Sweat. That, that's, that's another debate. These guys, you know, contrary to what many fans might believe, these guys are not stupid. So but that was the defense they played a year ago. Now, whether Josh Schwett's going to be in the same role this year in their 5-2 front, we don't know the answer to that. Right. You know, so But you hit on something that could well be the case. It's very possible if Graham can't really play effectively, Sweat could end up being the D-end on the other side where he's not inside an offensive tackle. And someone like Milton Williams with his hybrid D-end, D-tackle ability could be that guy that kind of plays the 4-I-5 technique with Reddick outside of him just as last year. That's where Avery was outside of Sweat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so but you don't necessarily – like I, to get to the second part of your question – you don't necessarily need to get like big beefy guys because you can play one gap even though you're playing a 5-2 front. You know, okay. I mean, there's still a lot of teams that play 5-2 fronts that still play with a nose shade, meaning he's a one technique, he's in a mm -hmm. gap. They still play with two, three techniques, meaning they're in a gap. You're not necessarily asking guys to hand fight in the old school two gap where they're hand fighting the guy right in front of them. Right. We ha we have had some intel that they are looking and they even as early as last year um and they drafted Tui Peloto and a little bit in this in mind just just that that head up got that nose that you're yeah. referring to. I think and, that they and, would like to address that. May not be a, a three lot of guys down like player that. but you know. Yeah, the thing is is there's not a ton of players like that. Right. You know, I mean, you know, one of them just got in the Hall of Fame but there's not a lot of Richard Seymours who are 6'5", mm -hmm. 315 who can do all those things. Can one sure. gap, two gap? There's not a lot of those guys. There aren't any. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> Something tells me we're going to be asking you when we get into the draft about guys like Jordan Davis a little bit for that reason alone. Yep. Uh, you know, the ability, you know, the rare breeds yeah, there. You know, and he's, you know, maybe he's the rarity. I mean, he's 340 pounds. Right. I mean, you know, when I was at the, at the combine, uh, and and that's that was Saturday night when the D line and the linebackers worked out. And you know, I'm rarely blown away by watching guys overall because I've seen so much. <clears throat> but that whole night, that group of D linemen and linebackers, just mm -hmm. the pure athleticism, mm -hmm. which 
is separate from playing football, obviously, but just the sheer athleticism. Because look, all the training's gotten better, the the sports science technology's gotten better. It's just going to keep going that way. Guys are just going to blow people away athletically. Um, mm -hmm. But it was amazing. We're just watching all these guys was was ridiculous. One thing about Richard Seymour before we get out of here, I just remember Greg watching tape with you and Jaws over the years, and you guys would show me Seymour what he can do. And you guys would just marvel at a guy that long who can move the, the way that he did. Now, we didn't know then he'd be a Hall of Famer, and he clearly deserves it because he's special. Have you seen anyone like Seymour that long? He could play in a variety of fronts and just be as effective? Wow. Let me look at that. I'm, I'm turning around because I've got the, the schedule behind me, so I'm just trying to look at teams. I um, just over the somebody, years, uh, there, there's got to be a Raven, right? That's fit yeah, like a Haloti Nada or, yeah. or well, maybe but uh, no, Haloti Nada was a was a guy, right? Um, right. I mean, I don't, I don't think this guy is exactly Richard Seymour, but I think that someone like Jeffrey Simmons on Tennessee, yeah, mm, yeah, close, good. you know, he's probably more 290, maybe I don't know his exact weight, but yeah. he's, mm -hmm. he's not 260, you know, right, right. and he's probably six four ish or so. You know, he's not built with the same length. Seymour had that unbelievable build. He almost looked lean, yeah. um, which is very, very rare. There's not a lot of guys like that. But, you know, just looking at the teams, Jeffrey Simmons might come to mind. Um, does does Campbell fit that? Calais? I mean, he's such well, a Calais weird. Campbell is yeah, huge he's, he's truly 6'8". And I've stood huge. next to Calais Campbell. Yeah. And he's, yeah. he's just different in terms of, you know, how tall he is. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't... Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Again, I just looking at the teams offhand, nothing's jumping out, but that doesn't mean there isn't another guy. I just, right. I was just great. I, mean, DeFar, I guess you could say to some degree, DeForest Buckner. Okay. Yeah. Possibly. That's a good one. That, cause the way that Seymour can move, Greg, I just remember, cause I love when you guys would point out stuff that you guys would find so unique. You'd not seen anyone else do. And I always found that to be very different. Look, right. Quarterback wise, you would show me how Peyton, Peyton Manning would um, pre-snap see the field and how he'd point everything out and so forth and how Brady at an early age would do that because uh, these guys are so unique to what they do. That's why they make the Hall of Fame. That, that to me is, as is is we end this discussion, what separates people, players from being good to very good to great to elite. It's just well, it eventually gets to the mental part, Adam. Okay, that, that's what it gets to. I mean, gotcha. and that's true at all positions. Okay, it's just that we we tend to think of that with quarterbacks because it's so visible. Sure. But if you talk to players, and I've been fortunate in my long career at NFL Films to do a lot of interviews. I don't do anywhere near as many as I used to do. You know, back in my early years, we used to do interviews every Saturday when teams would come play the Eagles, we'd go to the mm. hotel, you know, yeah. and I, I did that for years. So, I mean, I've interviewed players for years and years and years and, you know, and everything is mental. You know, there's a lot of talented players playing in the NFL. I mean, I watched college tape. There's a lot of talented players, you know, but it ends up being the mental part of the game, all the mm. details, the nuance, the disciplined crafts of each position. We just tend to think of it more visibly with quarterbacks. Yeah. Yeah. But, right. you know, you start talking. I remember year, years ago, John uh, Jeremiah Trotter, who I don't know mm. if he still lives in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, yeah. but he did. Um, and he came in and watched tape with me a number of times. And just the things he would point out, you know, which expanded my thought. It, it's almost too many things for me to sit and watch tape <laughs> because then I'd be watching one game for five hours. But mm -hmm. but obviously he's focused on specific things, sure. whereas sure. I'm trying to focus on many things. Yeah. So I can't take that kind of time. But right. just the things he would notice the second a play came up. You know, where was the back? You know, oh, yeah. that back's only six yards behind the quarterback, not eight. That tells me it's this. You know, little – I mean, there's always things like that that are – germane to every position and that make the difference i remember having an unbelievable conversation with larry fitzgerald mm. years ago when i interviewed him and we were waiting for the you know maybe there was a camera problem whatever we, we had 10 minutes to just shoot the breeze before yeah. the interview and when i get in those situations i just ask guys questions because i'm sure. trying to learn and yeah. i know larry fitzgerald anyway so it, it wasn't like you know i was talking to someone i didn't know yeah um, and I just started asking him about receiver splits and all the different ways you run routes from different receiver splits. I mean, that 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 was a 10-minute lesson in the receiver position. Mm. You know, a lot of people don't think of the game that way, you know, right. but that's the way it's coached. That's the way players, the great players, think about it. You know, that's that's just the way it is. 
And that's the way this show is, Greg. Great intel, great education, great stuff. I think people are pretty excited about what Hassan Reddick can do. He's a different style of pass rusher than Eagles fans have seen, so we're always tantalized by uh, something new there. So great stuff. Next week, we'll have you back, and in the intel with Greg Cosell will shift into draft preparation mode, and we, uh, we will not yet tell you or at least tell the people what prospect uh, we're going to get into. <laughs> we haven't decided it yet, but we will soon, and uh, we'll let you know. There's so a lot of guys. The time. Yeah, there's too many. I'm, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed because it's just, you know, as you guys know, I don't watch 20 plays of a guy and then say I'm done watching him. Yeah, right. I, I don't, I don't yeah. watch this just so I can make a Twitter comment. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank God for that. Thank God yeah. for that. So we'll catch up with you again next week as we start our, our draft preparation. So for Adam Kaplan and Greg Cosell, I'm Jeff Mosher. We thank you. You've been watching The Intel with Greg Cosell.